Soren Kierkegaard wrote, he who fights the future has a dangerous enemy. Life is very stressful. We think something is wrong with us, but the problems are endemic and systemic. As a people, we have lost our grounding in deep time and place. Our problems are at root relationship problems. We have a disordered relationship with the web of life. Right now, the more we connect the dots between the events, the more frightened we are. In fact, this reminds me of a little story. I had my three grandchildren camping on our land in a little tent. This is about two years ago. And Kate at that time was eight, Aiden was six, and Claire Annalise was four. So we're out in this little tent and we're, we're gonna sleep out all night. And you know, we're only like 30 feet from the house. But the, other, the two youngest ones, they are so excited and we're listening to the cicadas and we're listening for the peepers over on the lake, the frogs. But Kate kept going, Nana, I'm scared. I wanna go back to the house, the oldest. So I chided her and I go, Kate, you're the oldest. You should be braver and set a good example for your younger sister and brother. And she, you know, why are you scared? And she goes, Nana, they're too little. They don't know enough to be scared. <laughs> Neither individuals nor cultures can keep up with the pace of change. Recently, I was telling these same grandchildren about all the things that didn't exist when I was a girl. Uh, I mentioned television in my remote area, cell phones, the internet, cruise control, texting, computerized toys, laptops, video recorders, microwaves. The list was so long that my grandson Aiden asked me at the end, Nana, did they have apples when you were a girl? <laughs> We're bombarded by too much information, too many choices, too much complexity. Our problem-solving abilities, our communication and coping skills have not evolved quickly enough to sustain us. All of us find ourselves rushed, stressed, fatigued, and upset. On all levels, international, national, personal, many situations seem too complicated to be workable. As a friend of mine who's a school administrator said recently to me, Sometimes, sometime in the 1990s, problems stopped being solvable. And another friend put it this way, there are no simple problems anymore. In addition to the problems we can describe and label, we have new problems we can barely name. Writers are coining words to try to describe our new set of emotions. For example, Glenn Albrock coined the term solastalgia to describe homesickness or melancholia when your environment is changing all around you in ways you feel are profoundly negative. Joanna Macy uh, uses the term planetary anguish to describe our own pain, but also the pain of the earth and the animals suffering all over the world. On the other hand, even though we all want to help, all of us also feel like we have enough on our plates without taking on the melting polar ice caps. One night, Jim and I were talking this summer, and this is when I've been writing this book for a long time, living with these issues for a couple years. And meanwhile, that week, we had had just sort of an astounding death of many of our major appliances. A tree had hit our heater, air conditioner, our dishwasher had stopped working, our refrigerator, the temperature control was out of whack. And so Jim invited me, let's sit down and have a glass of wine before dinner. And I go, all right, as long as we don't have to talk about global climate change. I said, I, I'm not even up for a conversation about anything related to that. And Jim goes, I'm not even up for a conversation about the state of our appliances right now. <laughs> So we all have that. The other thing I want to say about the, the issue is the scope and scale of this are so enormous that they really exceed our human and cultural resilience systems. 
Thinking about this issue is like trying to count two billion pinto beans. Oftentimes, we don't know how to respond, so we don't respond. We have a kind of a learned helplessness response, but our sense of powerlessness becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. In States of Denial by Stanley Cohen, he writes about Germany and the denial of the Holocaust. He talks about a very interesting psychological state that many Germans were in at that time. He calls it a state of knowing not knowing that arises from ongoing traumatic situations. He said this willful ignorance occurs when information can neither be totally denied nor totally processed. It's a knowing not knowing. And that is the state most of us are in. Like, for example, this year in Nebraska in January, we had some 70 degree days. Now, a lot of, we had one January not too long ago when the temperature never got above zero. So this was very unusual weather. And I'd be going around to the grocery store, running into people at the post office, and they'd go, oh, isn't this weather wonderful? And then they, they'd say that that was the not knowing part. Then they'd say, but it sure wasn't like this when I was a kid. There was, there was always that kind of funny, isn't this great, but what is this really we're talking about? Uh, we live in a cultural denial. The Pew Research poll of September 2011 revealed that in spite of increasing evidence, belief in climate change is at its lowest level since 1997. In fact, it's decreased from 71% to 57% in the last year. And I think that's because as information gets more alarming, denial becomes stronger. It makes perfectly sense. The better, stronger the scientific evidence is, the more likely we are to see this increase in denial. In fact, even the way we talk about this is odd. We talk about believing in global climate change um, as if we're talking about believing in extraterrestrials, as opposed to respecting a body of scientific evidence. Partly these numbers reflect a well-funded, orchestrated misinformation campaign by the fossil fuel industry. And at Stanford right now, there's actually a scientist whose new field of study is called agnotology. Has anyone in this room heard of agnotology? It's the study of ignorance that is deliberately manufactured or politically generated. We have a lot of it around. Many people report um, lack of interest in this topic, but Renee Lertzman has done some very good research, which she wrote up in an article called The Myth of Apathy. She interviewed people and found that they care intensely about the environment, but their emotions are so tangled up and upsetting that they are beset by internal conflicts and, and struggle to find a way to adapt. They're not apathetic, but they're in a kind of a psychological paralysis. Furthermore, all cultures have rules about what can and can't be discussed. There's an old joke that comes from the Soviet Union. Two KGB men were walking down the street and one of them says to the other, what do you think of this system? The other one, very cautious, goes, well, I don't know. I probably think about the same thing you do. And the first agent said, in that case, I'm going to have to arrest you. <laughs> Dr. Kari Norgord has written, the denial of global warming is socially constructed in America it's almost as if relevant information is classified. Our national policy toward the devastation is don't ask, don't tell. Now part of this is so understandable. Everyone in this room wants to be able to have a shrimp cocktail without thinking about ruined mango groves or read a book about lions to children without wondering how many lions are left. Yet, we cannot solve a problem we will not face. And with awareness, everything is possible. Thank you.